Hello everyone, my name is Peter Holden and I will be your instructor for the law component of NABU 335. Welcome to the new normal. COVID-19 pandemic has thrown a monkey wrench into just about everything in our society, including the way Capilano University instructors and professors deliver their lecture material. Uh, I generally prefer to be in the classroom where I can dance and keep students engaged and uh, the students can freely ask questions uh, and I like the interaction. <clears throat> now that can be simulated with an online face-to-face -face lecture but I still feel the disconnect. So not being terribly uh, technologically savvy what I plan to do is do some video lectures like this and then others will be audio lectures where you follow along <coughs> pardon me, my lecture guide which is on eLearn. You look at the lecture guide and you hear my voice explaining the various concepts. Okay, <clears throat> um, what I'd like to do today is to talk um, about my background uh, not because I uh, enjoy talking about myself. Well, actually, I do enjoy talking about myself like most people do. Um, but I'm doing it for two specific reasons. The first one is at this point in your educational uh, career, you should become more and more critical uh, of the qualifications of the person that's standing in front of you trying to deliver certain materials. Um, you should also try to be cognizant of their biases and prejudices. And I, and I don't mean that in a race, religious, creed, sexual preference sort of way. What I mean is their biases and prefer preferences, their, their personal beliefs, and whether those are working into the lectures or not. Um, uh, I don't think I have any, any biases or, or uh, prejudices against groups in society. Um, but I do obviously, like everyone, have um, some personal opinions and what I will promise you right now is that I will deliver the lecture material to the greatest extent possible, exactly the way I'm supposed to. And if I decide to give you a personal opinion on some issue, I'll say that I'm getting up on my soapbox. Okay, I'm entitled to do that within certain limits according to the university's policy, as long as I let the students know. So that's my promise to you. Um, <clears throat> now, um, as to the credentials and qualifications, um, I think I meet those, but it's important for you to make up your own mind. So what I'd like to do is talk about my educational experience, my work experience, and my uh, teaching experience. So education, I have three degrees. Um, I went to the University of British Columbia and I got a BA in Canadian History and Political Science. What does that give me in the way of work opportunities? <clears throat> I can be a teacher at a university um, or a high school or I could uh, work for the government. Neither of those I want to do. Now life does throw curves at you because uh, here I am teaching but it's a different type of teaching. Um, it's not a it's not a career teaching like, you know, teaching grade 12 or, or something like that. What it is, is an extension of what I always wanted to do, and that's practice law. Um, and as far as government goes, well, the very first serious job I had was with the government, uh, mind you, a crown corporation. But I'll get into that in a minute. So I got my BA in Canadian History and Political Science and thought, okay, no, I... I can't use that directly to get involved in uh, the law or business. Um, I went back to the University of British Columbia and got my MBA in finance. Now, right off the bat, you got to wonder about UBC's uh, quality of their um, uh, programs because uh, here they gave a MBA in finance to a fellow who cannot even balance his checkbook. That's just a joke. Um, but anyway, I got my MBA and like you hear quite often, headhunters look for MBAs and offer them job positions even before they finish the program. So I had a job halfway through second year and that made it really hard to finish. I had to do a, a huge thesis on some particular business topic and I went, why? I mean, I'm already, I already 
have a job. So, like, you know, what's what's the um, the big deal here? Um, anyway, uh, I finished the MBA program and I started working. Now, I always intended to go to law school, but by the end of um, my BA and my MBA, I was pretty much tired with uh, the university environment and um, needed money. So I went to work for a crown corporation, which is the government. They just call it a crown corporation because then they can separate the workers from the actual government employees and uh, and the, the politicians can dance around and say, look how we reduce the number of government employees. Aren't we wonderful? They just shifted into a crown corporation. Uh, it started off as the Industrial Development Bank. It became the Federal Business Development Bank. And today it's the Development Bank of Canada. Why do they keep changing their name? It's so they can do something really interesting. I'm being a little facetious, but I found it to be a very conservative and not very rewarding job. Rewarding in the sense that I had all these skills that I learned in the MBA program, and I got to apply them in a real business environment. I was a credit officer and I wrote business plans for businesses that were seeking government funding from the, um, as it then was, Federal Business Development Bank. Uh, but it was very conservative and I did not fit the corporate culture. So I decided two years was long enough. Um, that way I could demonstrate that I could hold a job. And um, on the other hand, I would not be tainted by the conservative banker um, characteristic. So two years to the day, I quit to the surprise of other people in the office because, hey, here's a government job. Hey, here's a, you know, a nice salary, uh, job security, um, and, uh, and a wonderful pension at the end of it wasn't for me. So I went back to Ottawa. Not I shouldn't say went back to Ottawa. I went to Ottawa because I'd never been there before. Um, I went to Ottawa and began working for the National Research Bureau, which is um, uh, with the House of Commons and members of Parliament who don't have the staff that Congress men do uh, and women do in the United States, um, but they need research done. They could contact the Research Bureau and, the, and a person there would do uh, some research. I was only there for a short period of time before I got snapped up by a federal government cabinet minister to become an assistant in uh, his office. It was the Honorable Len Marchand, who was um, Canada's first native to become a senator. Um, he was the senator uh, for the Ministry of State for Small Business, and um, I became his business assistant. That was probably, in the scheme of my whole life to date, the most interesting job um, I've ever had. Um, I uh, had top secret clearance, uh, much to the shock of my parents when the RCMP dropped by my house, uh, or their house rather, because I was not living with them at that time, um, and started asking questions about their son, and they wondered, oh my God, what's he done? But I got top secret clearance, which means any document that goes to the cabinet for discussion, debate, and a vote before it goes to the House of Commons, I got to read and provide my minister a briefing memo on things that I think he should either criticize or support or additions to be made to it. It was, it was very, very exciting in that respect. I also got to travel around the country in a jet star with a steward coming down saying, Mr. Holden, may I refresh your drink? And Would you like the paper, the New York Times or the Ottawa Journal or the Financial Post magazine? Stayed in uh, best hotels and uh, I rode around in limousines. Um, and I want to get up on my soapbox here, as I mentioned earlier, for just a second and say that I don't begrudge our MPs and cabinet ministers their um, special compensation for travel. Um, there can be abuses, of course, but um, I think that they work extremely hard on our behalf. Not that I'm saying that they're productive, because, you know, quite often they're not, but they work extremely hard. They're always traveling. They have to live in Ottawa, away from their uh, homes. When Marshawn's family was in Kamloops, BC, he was in Ottawa all the time. 
Um, on weekends, they would be expected to travel and uh, do uh, political events at certain points in the country. And they were always going to seminars and conferences and things around the country. Uh, and I think it's very, very uh, taxing on them and on their families. And the, the divorce rate is really quite high. So I don't begrudge them any of that money. Um, so, uh, and I, uh, fortunately, the first minister I worked for was Len Marchand, and, and he was very careful about it. I remember one time um, he uh, had to fly to Montreal to do a, uh, a business uh, seminar with a group of small businessmen, and he asked me to go along too. And, of course, the department uh, for the ministry uh, set up my travel, and they put me in first class. <laughs> and Lynn Marchand was an economy because he did his own. Uh, and he was uh, a little uh, upset about that. So I had to actually get the, uh, uh, the ministry to uh, put me back in economy. And, you know, for, for a three-quarter of an hour flight or a one-hour flight, it didn't make any, any sense anyway. But he was very careful that way. Anyway, I worked for him for a year, and then there was a cabinet shuffle, and I moved to the business assistant for the Honorable Joe Gay, a French-Canadian cabinet minister from Manitoba. Um, and he was the Minister of National Revenue, um, and I, I was there for a year. And then there was another cabinet shuffle, and, uh, and the Honorable Tony Abbott took over the Ministry of National Revenue and the uh, Ministry of Small Business. I shifted back to the small business side again as the uh, business assistant, but um, because I was the senior person there, I was effectively like the executive uh, assistant in that department. Um, that was a political job, so an election was coming up, and uh, and I looked at the numbers, um, and I realized that the government was going to fall, and that uh, my member of parliament uh, was going to lose his seat in Mississauga. So I went in and I uh, gave Tony the bad news, and uh, he said he already knew, and he already had his next job lined up, uh, and what would what was I going to do? And I said, oh well, I want to go to law school. And he said, oh, okay, uh, you know, can I give you a letter of reference? And I said, oh, certainly that would be very helpful. And he said, all right, you write it, I'll sign it. <laughs> okay, all right. So what I wanted to do was I wanted to write a letter of reference that made it sound like I could walk on water. Um, <clears throat> on the other hand, I knew that he was actually one of those ministers that read the letters before signing them. Uh, and... Um, uh, some of, actually, some of them don't. What happens is some of them get their executive assistants to read them, and then they just give the book to the minister, and the minister signs them. And if there's a problem, then the executive uh, assistant will raise it with him. But Tony read his. So it was a very awkward letter to write. Uh, but I got one from him, and I got one from the Honorable Joe Gay, and I got one from uh, Len Marchand. And um, then... Uh, uh, I was uh, I, I went back and got a letter of reference from uh, Peter Watts, who taught the business law course at UBC in the undergraduate, and I took that course from him, and he became my mentor, uh, and uh, uh, gave me a lot of very good advice through law school and uh, when I was out practicing as a lawyer. Um, a gentleman and a, an incredibly uh, talented instructor. Anyway. Um, the, uh, so I, I graduated from law, um, on, I wrote my last exam sort of mid-May, and uh, I was on a Friday, and on the next Saturday I was on a plane back to Vancouver. Why? Because if anyone here has lived in Ottawa for a while, the winters are brutal. The summers are blistering hot, humid. So I was anxious to get back to British Columbia, and I got an articling position with um, a medium-sized law firm, Ray Connell, Lightbody and Reynolds. It was an excellent place to article. Uh, and I should explain that articles um, is um, between graduating from law school and getting called to the bar and being able to practice. So at law school, they teach you how to argue a case between the Supreme Court or in front of the Supreme Court. In articles, they teach you how to find the Supreme Court House. That's how practical it is. And I'm serious. They would uh, they would say, okay, we have to file this notice of motion, uh, take it to the court and file it. And you really don't know what that means. You know, you mean you have to find the courthouse, you have to go to the registry, you have to figure out what, what desk to go to, who to talk to, all that sort of stuff. 
and they teach you how to fill out the forms like um, purchasing property and things like that. Then you write bar ads, those are your bar examinations. You pass those and then the uh, 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 Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of British Columbia says, uh, congratulations Mr. Olden, you're, you're called to the uh, practice of law and they give you a little scroll and bingo, that's it, you're called to the bar. What does called to the bar mean? If anyone has been in a courthouse, and I hope it's only as a witness or as a, a as an, uh, someone that in the audience, the rabble sits at the back. Then there's a sort of a railing, and then there's the place where the plaintiff and the defendant or the accused and crown counsel sit, and then there's the judge. Um, well, that railing is called the bar, and nobody can go beyond that except the people involved in the court case, the litigants.